Can I welcome you to New Art Exchange for this evening, this very special evening, um, where we have Jonna Comfra and Jenny Waldman from 1489 now. Um, and we're here to talk about the film that we're screening downstairs as an installation, Mimesis African Soldier, which is part of the 1489 now program that commemorates 100 years of World War One. And so let me first start by introducing uh, the panel. Um, and the format of the evening is that Jenny Waldron will talk about 1418 Now as a program and give us his insights and lay out the context as to their involvement with the Mimesis African Soldier film downstairs, but also the wider program, which is a significant program engaging 25 million people over the four year period from 2014 to 2018. So let me start by introducing John Comfra. Um, he, know, he needs no introduction, actually, um, because he's been part of the family in this neck of the woods for many decades, actually. And the last time he screened his unfinished conversation, the incredible insight into Professor Stuart Hall with a three screened um, installation in 2018, 2013, sorry, and that was in May. 2013, and here we are six years on. So John Acompa is a hugely respected artist and filmmaker whose works are characterized by their investigations into memory, post-colonialism, temporality, and often explores the experiences of migrant diaspora globally. To quote The Guardian, he has secured a reputation as one of the UK's most pioneering filmmakers whose poetic works have grappled with race, identity, and post-colonial attitudes for over three decades. Please, a big round for John. It's always a delight to have John back and bring some wisdom and poetics into the room. Alongside John is Jenny Waldman. Jenny Waldman is the director um, of 1418 Now, the UK's official first World War Centenary cultural programme, and was appointed to the role in 2013. And prior to that, she was the creative producer of the London 2012 Festival for the Olympic and Paralympic Games. She's also a board member at Barbican Centre and was the director of arts and, and programming at Southbank Centre. Um, a cultural fellow of King's College London, and both Jenny and John were awarded CBEs in honour of their work and commitment. So this is a, a great <laughs> So I'm going to pass it over to Jenny just to give some context to the 1489 programme. Okay. Give us some insights into what it is and how it sits within the evening tonight. Okay. Well, thank you, Skinder, and thanks for inviting me. So some of you will have had an opportunity to um, have a proper look at John's uh, piece downstairs. This is just one still from it, and here's another. It's a most extraordinary piece, and I'm sure you will all have um, a great uh, opportunity to sit and look at the, the whole triptych for uh, the length of it. Um, it formed part of 1418 Now, which was a programme, as Skinder says, of arts commissions uh, looking at the centenary of the First World War. We were set up to um, be the cultural programme for the centenary, uh, first time a government has, in this country has ever thought of contemporary arts being part of um, a war commemoration. Um, and we decided to go about it by working with arts organisations up and down the country, uh, like the brilliant New Art Exchange, to commission artists, um, John and many others, from both the UK and around the world, who would be invited to look afresh at the events of a war that some people may feel is quite distant, it's 100 years ago, but still resonates um, very extraordinarily, I think, in the world today. And the impact of it uh, really merits further exploration. Um, 
one of the things that, uh, um, that I did uh, when I started uh, in 2013 was a very quick Google of how many countries uh, were involved in the First World War. And uh, over 100 of today's countries in the world were involved directly in the First World War, and many others uh, were involved through um, arms dealing, through uh, finances, and so on. Um, so it was genuinely the first global war, and yet I think that many of us um, who are either at school now or have been to school at any time in the last 50 years are taught about it being a European war about the trench warfare. Um, we get taught it quite a lot in school, both in primary and secondary school, but an awful lot of that history is hidden. So one of the things that we did in 1418 now is just look a little bit broader and invite uh, some of the world's best artists, including John, to um, look themselves at the colonial aspects at the hidden histories of the First World War. I myself worked with a small team of producers and curators. The curator on this project working with Skinder and John was Tamsin Dillon, who unfortunately can't be here today. Um, but uh, her expertise, Skinder's, and John and his team created the piece uh, downstairs or helped nurture John through creating the piece downstairs. Um, in addition to that, I. I hope some of you have seen Akram Khan's Zenos. It's continuing to tour. It's currently in Italy. We'll come back to the UK. Um, it tells an extraordinarily powerful story of an Indian colonial soldier in the First World War. William Kentridge's piece, The Head and the Load, was his exploration of, um, of Africa in the First World War and the colonial oppression that uh, led up to the First World War and continued throughout it. And I think he felt as well that it was a journey of exploration for him as a white South African who had learnt history at university and, again, who just didn't know that story. Um, Imran Qureshi, I think an artist that probably most of you are well aware of, did the most beautiful piece. This is outside Bradford Museums. Um, but in addition to those very important pieces and many others, uh, we invited artists to look at other aspects of the First World War. So this is Rachel Whitebury's very beautiful piece in Dolby Forest that we commissioned with the Forestry Commission. It's called Nissen Hut, and it's a tribute, of course, to um, Peter Nissen, uh, the colonel in uh, 1916, who was asked to find a quick way of, um, of creating uh, uh, weatherproof spaces for both for men and for goods, and created the Nissen Hut. These are some of our Dazzle Ship series, uh, uh, which this one is Peter Blake's. Um, Kira Phillips uh, with the Edinburgh Art Festival and Tauber Auerbachs uh, in New York because the dazzle camouflage of the First World War stretched over to New York. And this is a piece that we did, um, a series that we did with Liverpool Biennial. Um, I hope that you've seen the statue of Millicent Fawcett in Parliament Square. We spread ourselves into looking at women's roles in the First World War and, of course, the fi finally, the achievement of votes for, for some women um, and the ability to stand for Parliament that was achieved right at the end of the war in both February and then uh, the right to stand for Parliament in November of, of 2018. And that... Um, brings me on to another kind of aspect of our work, which was the large-scale participatory project. So this is Artichoke's Processions, um, which we invited women and girls from around the country to create extraordinary banners um, inspired by the suffrage uh, movement, both the suffragettes and the suffragists, and to walk in the colours of the suffragettes in the four political capitals of our nations in London, Edinburgh, Belfast and Cardiff. Um, participatory in a different way, Jeremy Della's piece uh, that came to Leicester. I can't now remember whether it came to Nottingham as well, but definitely in Leicester. Uh, this was in about 96 different places around the UK, um, some 1,500 uh, volunteers dressed in authentic First World War uniform appearing unannounced on the 1st of July 2016 on the centenary of the first day of the Battle of the Somme. Um, if you saw any of them... They didn't speak, but they handed you a card, and that card had the name, rank, and regiment of a man who died on that very day, 100 years before. Um, 
Another and final uh, one that I'll just sort of mention was Danny Boyle's Beaches project that we did right at the end, having worked out uh, how to do these very large scale pieces. We did this one on 32 beaches around the UK. So with this, with many projects in individual places, with projects right across the art spectrum, including um, the Poppies tour, including Peter Jackson's film, They Shall Not Grow Old, including very large scale works that really kind of resonated with participants, but also on social media and media. We managed to engage 35 million people in a real kind of reconsideration, I hope, of the First World War um, and what that war did to both the individuals involved and also their communities and diaspora and, and nations for the following hundred years. Thank you, Jenny, for that um, insight into 1480. Just a quick question before we get into the good conversation here with John. Um, how does something like such a major initiative come about? Who makes the decision and how do you get involved? <laughs> well, it's a bit random, really. I think that's part of the part of the challenge now um, is to really kind of um, embed the idea that contemporary artists should be at the center of our national discourse. So I think this particular program, 1418 Now, came out slightly uh, bizarrely. It came from the success of the London 2012 Festival, which you'll remember was another UK-wide much more celebratory festival of really a sort of showcase of uh, the, um, uh, the arts in the UK. And the success of that program in 2012 led the uh, Government Department for Culture, Media and Sport uh, to think in 2013, when they were thinking about the First World War centenary, about whether there should be an arts program. And as I said before, it had never happened before. So it was a pretty bold and brave step for them. And the second really bold and brave step was to uh, create this program and then spin it off as completely independent from government. And that, of course, uh, with our arm's length principle in this country is the kind of absolute essential. So we were uh, established and then um, the Imperial War Museum offered to host us and they gave us amazing um, research facilities for each of the artists to to work with their archive and their historians. Um, but we were allowed to curate um, and work with arts organizations on inviting artists to say and do whatever they wanted. Yes, so it was an incredible program on an imaginable scale uh, concerning the artists who selected, the, the results and impacts, and of course the collective experience of the British public to experience something from 100 years ago in the contemporary age. So it's a, I mean, hats off to such an incredible program. Congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> So there are a few um, events still happening back on Carlos Dante's auditorium, so do engage with that. Of course, we have uh, Mimesis African Soldier here, and we have the artist. We have great pulling power because we've, uh, we've sold that here and beyond. We have a waiting list outside and a live broadcast, so wave to the cameras under the, the, the worldwide web. Well, well, John, making a film like this is definitely an epic journey. And the subject matter it explores is often washed away. Um, but apart from the themes of lost history, although that's an essential part of it, what guides you to create the content of the film? And what is it that you are seeking? Um, thank you for inviting me, by the way. <laughs> and, and thank you all for, for coming. Um, I'm going to try and think aloud some of the implications of the work because there are reasons why you get into something, but they're not always necessarily the ones you're left with when you're done. You, know, you end up in a, in a very different place. Um, it, it didn't seem that way in the beginning, but it became more and more important as we went on for me to have this effective anchor of autobiography. Um, basically, uh, my grandfather, who was from the Gold Coast, went to work 
in northern Nigeria in the 20s, where he met my grandma uh, and married she was my mom, and at some point she came to me um, via detour through Ghana. Uh, now, that's a fairly basic West African tale of intermarriage between different tribes on that coast, but in this particular instance, the reasons why my grandpa was there is intimately connected to that Great War. Because he had taken a job which would have been normally done by a white European colonial officer. And the only reason he was there was because there was a shortage <laughs> of colonial officers to take up. So in a very direct causal way, I am here <laughs> because of that stupid war. <laughs> and, and so at some point, when one starts to make works, um, it always is important to find the ways in which you yourself are attached to it. And so I, I'm attached by reasons of birth, by reasons of history, um, and that's the animus. That was the animating um, device, if you will. I mean, there's, there's a lot in that film um, that nice. takes you on a journey. Um, and there is a lot, you know, when you watch it and keep watching it and watch it again, there is, there is much to learn. What, what would you say was your biggest learning in making that film? And when you watch it again, what do you, does anything surprise you? Or did the process, did anything surprise you? Yeah, I mean, the, you know, the, these historical and archival based research legend projects always feel, well, to put it this way, they have a kind of three act structure to them. Uh, especially in terms of how they feel to you, you know, the, the figure involved. So, I, I mean, at the beginning, I always think we're never going to make sense of this. You know, you've got 50 hours of clips from all over the place. None of it really amounts to more than an hour, and, you know, and they're all in different bits and you think, this is never going to work. You know? mm -hmm. um, so I'm always like, and, it's, and at some point, um, you find uh, uh, a way of getting um, all these fragments to believe that they can have a conversation. And that's usually the second act, that's usually the beginning. Because everything, all of us, bits of archive, human beings, we all believe we're unique, don't we? You know, and um, fragments are very vocal. Like, oh, I'm not talking to that first one. No, no. <laughs> I don't talk to German footage. <laughs> I'm an English piece of film, you know. Um, and you have to find a device. It differs from project to project by which um, uh, you persuade them to, to talk to each other. I mean, part, part of the reason why uh, they, in the end, agree is because I have to say to that material, look, listen, um, there's something, people always talk to me about hidden history. You know, and you have to ask them, since you exist as pieces of film with figures of colour in it, how come you've been hidden? Why are you hidden? And the reasons are fairly obvious. You know, they, well, they are when you understand it. It's not that they're they're not hidden because they're, they've been literally locked up. There was something else standing where they would have been, which basically said to them, okay, I got this. I got this. I can, you know, in other words, there's a whole bunch of archival material from the war. Most of it has, frankly, white people in it, you know, because they're in the majority. And the way whiteness functions in these spaces of authority is to inadvertently ex exclude others by simply standing in the place of everything. It just says, I got this, I can do this for us. So part of what you have to do is to get material which is quote unquote hidden 
to value and valorize its own legitimacy, its own authority. You know? And it does that not on its own, because it doesn't mean anything on its own. It can only work if it starts to talk to other material. And so gently, I have to say to each clip, yes, I know you don't like that one, <laughs> but it would be great if you took it just for a moment. <laughs> And if you, if you, it's, so it's a wager. If you agree to talk, then I can talk to that guy over there who's also agreeing not to join you, to maybe moment, you know, so it's basically a, a way of getting all of them to give you um, a kind of temporary contract of civility. Yeah? To just get them to talk to each other. <laughs> and once they begin, they start to enjoy it. And then you start. And before you know it, you have a, a piece. What an incredible term, a temporary contract of civility. Right. Well, that's kind of weird. <laughs> <laughs> they have to agree not to kill each other, quite yeah. literally. Yeah. Yeah. They agree. On the archive, let's mm. just explore this a little bit. Mm. And then we'll come into talking about some of the places I'm making. On the archive, you represent um, a whole range of in series of moments in history, which is incredible. I mean, you know, 100 years of footage, or footage from 100 years ago, and seeing it, um, and seeing how it's stored. Because you talk about, in particular, prison. Mm. That's, that's very kind of um, a white perspective, or a European perspective. Let's expand on that. Yeah. What, what did you discover, and how did you get this? And where, where, where is this archive from? Because it seems to be scattered across various sources. I mean, you know, the, the archive exists in the form that it does because the team is now incredibly experienced actors. <coughs> so whether it's David Lawson or Lina Gopal or, or my boy Ashley Comfort, you know, they, they, they just cast their net very wide. And most of the project is, in fact, the researching material. And we don't... Um, Sometimes things are just there, but there's simple reasons why they are hidden from view. Mm. So um, there's not much point, for instance, and this sounds obvious, but you know sometimes it takes a while to to deduce the obvious. There's no point in going to the Library of Congress, for instance, and saying, "I want show me what you have of Nigerian soldiers." Ghanaian soldiers. These are categories that didn't exist. You know, um, or um, what, can you show, give us anything you might have on Ugandan armies? Mm. <laughs> they might have Bambara armies, they might mm. have, you know, Hindu mm. armies or Igbo soldiers, but they don't have Ugandan, <laughs> they don't have Ghanaian. You know, so you have to initially just dial down the ambitions, and look look for categories, groups, identities, which have quite literally disappeared in the maelstrom of modernity, they've been wiped off, um, and resurrect those. And in the process of resurrecting them, they literally held into being all these tentacles into the, into the past. And by that process, things begin to show up. Um, they don't necessarily show up all together. So if you see any sequence in African soldier of archival material, nine out of 10, if it lasts for a minute, it would have come from 10 different sources. So nothing, nothing there comes from one place, as it were. You have to literally piece things together. And that's why the, the cordiality, this contract of civility is also important. Because when they arrive, they don't look the same. They're different in quality, they're different. Mm -hmm. you know, and, and so you, <laughs> you're persuading people to share things who have very little in common in, in the beginning. Uh, or persuading, not people, but you know, um, material to share things. Um, and, and you have to almost uh, accept that these differences are not, they're not technical ones, they're almost differences of ontology, of being, mm -hmm. right? Because when something's come from a German museum, 
it has been imbued with a certain <laughs> German way of doing this. <laughs> so it's not just a piece of rhetoric, it's, it's a kind of embodiment of a certain way of seeing the world, lensing it, framing it, etc., etc. It has, for want of a better word, being ontology. And you're, you're trying to persuade these different beings to, to converse. Mm. Quick, quick question on mm. the archive then. Because mm. um, the archive um, represents a, a particular prism of view, like you said, is a Germanic angle in yes. the German <laughs> way of oh, sure. you know, seeing history. Mm. But also, historically, uh, the colonial um, empires mm. also had very much racial divisions in terms of how they recruited and who they recruited. Mm. So, for example, in Indian soldiers, they looked to <laughs> soldiers from the Punjab and the Gurkhas. They were seen more as manly, or so forth. So, in the archive, there's, there's a kind of um, labelling of the individuals. What, what can you tell us about this? What did you, what did you find absurd or interesting? Well, I mean, there's, there's a, a, a really interesting library in the Humboldt University in Germany. Uh, and one of the things they did, which is uh, now also the British Museum, is to record uh, the voices of hundreds of men, usually prisoners. Um, and the questions were basically simple. You are Hindu, you know, um, recite your album, sing as a favorite folk song. So on the, on the surface, there's this polyphony of voices, and, you know, different languages and so on. Now, <laughs> on the battlefield, that made no difference at all. If you're a wog, you're a wog. Simple. Um, so... These decorative differences were ones that we needed as a way of excavating, but they couldn't be the animating features of the piece. Because it became clear very quickly that whether you were a Sikh or uh, you know, Muslim or Igbo, it didn't matter. It didn't matter. In terms of the reception that you got, you know, there's a kind of poetic relation uh, that most of these figures from the colonial world had with this monolith <laughs> called the war machine. And um, it's, it's, it's a relation of disenchantment. And disenchantment, it's important to realize, is the feeling one has after love. You know, it's the feeling that comes when one starts to fall out of love with something, both literally and metaphorically. Right? Which means that, that these figures arrived in a state of love. Yeah? Not naive, oh, it's so great, we're going to die, we can't be you know, but they took the affinity with this place incredibly seriously. They took they took the the affinity to the crown um, uh, very seriously. Jenny was showing us a letter earlier on, which is a kind of remarkable document. It's it's downstairs in the in the exhibition on the first floor. <laughs> she might be able to tell you about it. They took it very seriously. So we we have to take them seriously. In that disenchantment, because that's where they arrive by the end. I suppose there was a deal to be struck as well politically for many of those communities, and one of those deals, maybe that comes into World War II more so than World War One, whereby soldiers are sold a dream of equality if yeah. you contribute to the empire. Even Marcus Harvey sent yeah. Caribbean troops yeah. to the World War to on that basis that you could become equal as a consequence by sharing world. <laughs> But, but, but Garvey's, you know, the First World War is really, really important mm -hmm. for the nationalisms that will become such a major feature mm -hmm. of people of colour in the 20th century. Because if you take, for instance, um, Garvey, 
Gandhi's biggest, um, he's a Pan-African leader, in case anyone's interested. He was the, 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 the preeminent Pan-African leader of the 20th century. From Jamaica, moved to New York uh, at the turn of the last century. The biggest uh, uh, battalion or branches of the UNIA, the United Negro Improvement Association, were all in New York. Yeah? And if you look at the film, the biggest battalion of black soldiers, mm. African soldiers of African mm. origin that you see in Unisys, were marching in New York. They're, they're, they're New Yorkers, they're black Americans, mm. essentially. Um, many of those men who came back from the war joined the UNIA. You know, because what follows the disenchantment. Okay, I thought you loved me, but really you don't do that. So I, I'm going to walk off somewhere else. What follows the disenchantment is the resolution to do something for yourself. Yeah, so the call for autonomy, which begins the, the, the rise of, of black nationalism, or African, pan-Africanism in the 20th century. Oh, sorry. Closer. Is as a direct consequence of, of, of the First World War. So it's really important um, for that reason. And um, one of the reasons why it felt necessary to do it is just to look at what might have been the conditions of their disenchantment. Why people would go off to, to war and come back thinking, okay, I'm, I'm done with this. Mm. Yes. Well, is it has a reflective, melancholic closure of some sort. Certainly a poetic revisionist exploration of a history perhaps not spoken regularly enough. And you use a series of words that set the scene at the beginning, and disenchantment is one of them, first word. Disillusionment, distress, disgust, discouragement. And these dissing words cause anguish. Um, regret for some people, um, anger and upset for others, including audiences of today. When we uncover such histories through an artistic prism, how does this subjective reflection offer insights beyond the facts shared through formal documentation? So, in a sense, you as an artist, revising a history through the prism of a subjective truth, how does that lure us into a new knowledge or emotion that goes beyond these kind of facts? Well, I mean, that's a really difficult question to answer, but I'll, I'll give it a go. Um, I made a film uh, once with a historian, an Italian historian called Carlo Ginsberg. Um, and Carlo and I worked on a film called The Cheese and the Worms, which was about um, a 15th century <coughs> Uh, peasant in the Friulian mountains who uh, was uh, basically taken to, to, to Venice and, and burned to a stake by the Inquisition. Um, and Carlos' book was in part the result of him going into the library of the Vatican and the Doge's library in Venice, finding the court records, the Inquisition records. And as he uncovered them, he realized that what he was in fact stumbling upon was the voice of this man, Minocchio, nobody, peasant. But what he had to say was really important because he, he became a kind of gateway for Carlo. Um, for understanding how we made a transition um, in Europe, but across the planet, I suppose, from a sort of agnostic, pagan world into a Christian one. And Minocchio basically said he didn't believe. This is why he was tried and, and sentenced by the Inquisition. He didn't believe there was such a thing as God. He said, we emerged spontaneously from putrefaction. <laughs> like worms with cheese, which is why the boys call the cheese and the worms. 
Um, and I've always tried to remember that. You know, uh, I asked him at the end you know, why, why we were doing it. And he said, you know, because we have an obligation to the dead. And it's not a pious obligation. This obligation to the dead involves recognizing the extent to which they animate things in our present, you know, uh, and make sense of things in our present. So I'm not interested in the First World War just because it's something in the past. I think there are connections um, with the present that are worth exploring. And you can sense that's happening when, when the, the Wagnerian project of marrying archive with other elements begin to suggest that you might be on the road somewhere. You know, so that you, you know um, at some point, as I said, there's, there's this feeling that, that you're never going to arrive in a, in a space of recognition or a space of certainty. Um, but uh, at some point, and there are different reasons why that happens for different projects, at some point, you always make the transition to the second act, where you feel welcomed, not embraced, just welcomed into the fold by the material. And at, at that point, the conversation becomes really interesting. <laughs> because <laughs> because I, don't, I can't win in every battle. I go into these projects, and there are things I want to do, the things I want the material to do. But there's a kind of willfulness um, uh, that, that stops things happening. Very basic things. You know, look, there's a, there's a shot um, of guys marching and it lasts 12 seconds. I can't, I need 15. <laughs> I can't make, I can slow it down, but then you see my hand. You see? Okay. Yeah? Um, so I, the, the battles I can win and the ones I can't win. <laughs> and when, the ones you can't win, you have to then make this pact with that material to explore an alternative which is both satisfactory to you and it. You know. And that's also why I talk about ontologies, because this willfulness is built into the material. You know, they don't say at some point, oh well actually, and you want 15, don't you? I'll give you 15. <laughs> no. This is their DNA. They, you know. It's as if it's a living material. It is. You know. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. And it has its own voice. Absolutely. There's a lot of philosophical foundation in all this. Um, at some stage, there's a pragmatic moment um, where you think, how the devil am I going to condense all this information and make this film? When does that moment arrive? Because you talk about material, you talk about its dialogue with you. Um, and there's a lot of material. I mean, you've got 17, three odd minutes downstairs. Or you have gone through treacherous amount of um, trenches. Yes. We've mm -hmm. dug out a lot of material. Yeah, I mean, there's, uh, there's, I don't know, another 80% there. Um, so, th it's, it's not true that there's a shortage. Sorry, it's a bit hot in here. It's not true that there's a shortage. There is, of course, relative. But, but at any point, um, the multi-screen projects have a kind of voraciousness to them. And so um, one feels compelled to feed them with as much as possible. And at some point, you have to then start pulling it back. Because, you know, because you, I, I know you don't want a two hour film, so you would have killed me. <laughs> <laughs> three hour, three screen. <laughs> well, anyway, it's 73 minutes multiplied by three. Yes. Which, yes. which brings me on to an interesting inquiry around the kind of aesthetic and signature here, um, around the three pronged approach or the, the triptych film. Mm -hmm. what, what does that give you as a filmmaker, as an artist? That's additional to the single screen. I mean, there's a sort of there's a, what we call the an Aristotelian certainty about it. single screen. Single screen say, hey, you know, A has to go to B and B goes to C. You know. <laughs> there's a story, quote unquote. <laughs> um, 
many of us who've turned to more discipline work have doubts about this kind of circular narcissism. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I want to now work more with projects in which the humility of my approach in the beginning is mirrored by the form. And so I want projects in which different elements talk <coughs> to each other and make wages and, and gambles and make pleas for <laughs> space and time, you know, because that's the, that's the essence of the demos. That's the essence of the right thing to do when you are really um, in, in other walks of life. That's the right thing to do. Listen to others, be kind, be considerate, and so on. Well, part of the structure of multi screen work is trying to find a form in which disparate elements can coexist, can have conversations, however elliptical, however discordant, and however unruly. Um, they've agreed to sit together in some forced unity for for a bit, and and that's a good thing, you know. Um, it it suggests multiplicity. It suggests the hybrid. It suggests um, you know different vantage points, if you will, by which the real can be approached, you know, um, because because the real is is a much um, I mean, do you think? Very much. I mean, it's a, just in its simplistic analysis, watching a three split screen is three factorial in that moment in time. Mm. So that's what you experience. So you've got those kind of prisms of interpretation from the stratification of maths. Mm. Um, it goes deeper, of course, because there's layers of emotion. Watching the screen downstairs as you um, were preparing today and making sure that everything was ticking in the right sort of order. Um, I recalled um, looking at those screens and the magnificence of um, colour and width and breadth that it gives you as an audience member and how you can observe the emotion um, on a very singular level and a very multiple level mm -hmm. in its kind of binary opposite. Um, I think that intrigues me is, is, is the process of making such a film. Um, without getting into the trade secrets here, um, John, about how you go about it, I mean, just maybe share some insights into what a process of making such an extraordinary film takes for you. What state of mind do you have to get into to take on such a big subject? Who's in the team? How do you select locations, um, etc.? Um, you have several actors featuring. How do they get involved? They have costumes. And I've got to ask where that dead horse comes from. <laughs> <laughs> so all of these kind of things intrigue me on a pragmatic level, as much as the philosophical foundation is actually. Yeah, yeah. but they, they, they all they all start from from that quote unquote philosophical foundation. Huh? almost slavish attachment to to the modernist project and in this case a kind of cubist version of it and sort of Rubik cube yeah. approach to, to, the, to the, and specifically what that means or practically what that means is this for instance um, I know that we need we need these conduits through which um, their past can pass through into the present, um, beyond the archive. They, they are the, the spirit mediums, if you will. They, you need these intermediaries. Um, so I knew that we needed figures. Um, but I, I, I don't want them to, to speak, because, because then they take the place of the past, which is not the game. The game is to to literally be possessed and go into some kind of trance in which the past comes into being. So 
the most difficult bit, which is the bit that I have with pretty much everything, is persuading <laughs> persuading them that they could do less and more at the same time. You know, like, mm. okay, um, you really don't need to speak. I mean, did you, did you try saying that to actors? <laughs> 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 who yep. believe that yep. they're only alive if they speak. Um, so it's a, it's, a, <laughs> it's a wager, and partly what that involves is being committed to theatrical principles, the work of Grotowski, if you like, physical thing, essentially. Um, so you, you hear them with all of that, and they go, well, what the fuck do we do with all of this? <laughs> We're actors. So I then have to... Um, essentially hand over quite a bit of what they do to them. Okay. You, you tell me how you will come to me. And then, and then I'll just tell you whether it's right or not. And bit by bit, that's how we arrive. So we arrive together in the same space. Um, I have some ideas, obviously, about how they should move in it, but um, not more than that. And, and we basically devise a sequence together. And who, who designs their costumes? You obviously have a costume designer. Yes. And, yeah. and your team researches. Yeah, I mean, uh, the, almost all the, the pieces which have a sort of, quote-unquote, period feel <laughs> to them, uh, were all designed by uh, our main costume designer, who is... Uh, Jackie Vernon. So Jackie Vernon is a costume designer and we work with her to, uh, to, to do this. She will research it, obviously, and, and throw options at you and, and then we decide. I mean, this was made a little bit more um, complicated in the sense that I wanted a sort of United States of Africa army. I wanted people to come from all over, you know, uh, and we weren't particularly bothered about whether they were German or I, I just need all the great armies that, you know, French, British, you know. So when you look at the, the group, oh, well, you were on the group. <laughs> You're not married. Look at, look at the group no. that's coming. Well, so no. there's, there's an American, mm -hmm. uh, a Canadian, and a Brit. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, and because I know they were there. You know, we, we haven't made it up, so it's not a fiction in that sense. But there were African soldiers in these armies. They're, they're there. Yeah, I mean, other, other elements of the film which were super intriguing were the, the sound you used and the songs that you feature. Yeah. And the final song, which is a really sort of piercing African female voice. How is that selected and how, how do you go about Because that sounds like an epic. And I mean, surely there's an album here. Yeah, well, David and um, a young ethnomusicologist called Rudy researched this. Yes. David Lawson, I mean, sorry. One of the producers. Um, researched this for about a year. And I, I got presented with like hundreds of tracks. Um, and I, I do the same thing with them as I do with with the archival material or, you know, I just literally ask them to not be overly narcissistic, to agree to this contract of civility, you know. Um, so if they agree to be, for instance, none of them, you, none of them are what you hear. They've been broken up, rearranged, sometimes repeated, put in places that don't exist, you know. Um, that's what I mean by the contrast. <laughs> if they start saying, oh, well, uh, this is shocking and outrageous, I'm not doing this, then they're out. You know, because, um, <laughs> you know, there's a fluidity there. Absolutely. Yes. Um, and flexibility. You know, um, I'm really, really interested in folk forms now for some reason. I'm not completely sure why that's the case. But I think it has something to do with time and timelessness and the proximity 
of that material to periods that I'm interested in. Um, so, for instance, the woman singing at the end is inadvertently one of these conduits because it's a folk form, which means that I'm listening to a voice that a Senegalese soldier would have heard. Yeah? Um, it's that simple. But there's a way in which they, they, they create these weird portals, uh, uh, you know, rips in the fabric of time, by making connections that, um, yeah. I also just, you know, it's like this weird thing, you know, I've tried different voices, on it, which is what led me to the voices I was telling you about from the library in uh, Humble Unit. Yeah. Tried and they just, it felt like a documentary. And by that I mean, it felt like a recreation of the past. A reconstructive project, mm -hmm. and that's not mm -hmm. what we're trying to do. I mean, we're not trying to take the place mm -hmm. of the archival. And so, the present fragments exist because I need, I need a way of initiating this conversation between the present and the past. And and so, the present material is is almost entirely. There to be possessed by it. That's why it's there. It's not there to replace, you know. And every time you hear the voice, you thought, mm, yeah, it's, <laughs> mm. it's, it's sort of sad. Um, it, I mean, basically, anything that tries to turn the archival material, in this particular instance, the official quote unquote footage, into uh, illustration or supplement felt wrong, um, felt not the right way to go, um, because it's a commemorative piece, <laughs> so we don't want to do, I don't, I didn't want to do what I normally don't like the archive to do, which is to say, I'm the only thing that can speak, mm. it, it's not, because most of the time, it doesn't say anything you understand, <laughs> most of the time it talks crap as well, <laughs> you know? um, so, part of the bending of the will of the past to some of the demands of the present involves me agreeing and accepting that I'm not going to do that either. I'm not going to stand in front of everything saying the only way you'll understand this is if you look at stuff I shot or, you know, that's not, that's not the point. Hence the kind of subjective prism Indeed. offering a particular angle yeah. Um, that has a value. I mean, there's no doubt. And talking of value, I wonder if I ask 1480. Yes, please do. <laughs> the film and what you as a team and what you observe in your audiences, that you also learned as a, as a consequence of this uh, incredible epic. Well, I think every time I see the film or listen to John talking about it, I just learn more. Um, and I think it's, I mean, I think to distill that, because obviously you learn a lot about how an artist works and how an artist kind of perceives the world and looks at the past. But I think that one of the things that listening to John now has just reminded me is that um, what contemporary artists do is they can look both to the past, the present, and the future. And actually, John's, um, and I, I think artists mostly are talking to an audience today and looking ahead. That's what contemporary art does. It tr helps us try to imagine um, a future, to, uh, helps us try and understand where, where we are in this world. Um, but using the past, using archive, using heritage, using history to do that actually gives us a, a three-way perspective into past, present, and future. And I think where we grapple with... Uh, uh, there was one point where I was thinking about the 2018 uh, program just after the referendum and uh, thinking everything I see on the front page of my newspaper has an absolute root in the First World War. If you think about nationalism in the UK and 
you know, you go back to Ireland and the departition of Ireland and the First World War. If you think about what's happening in the Middle East now, uh, that, you know, it's absolutely about the First World War. That's, you know, that was going on for centuries before, of course, but 1917 was a crucial moment and that it's very live today. If you look at the Balkans, if you look at an, a hu huge areas of the world, but also women's rights and the Me Too movement, all of these things, you can look back and by looking back through the through the perceptions and intellectual ability of artists to to look in both of those directions you learn something new and what happens is you learn it at an emotional level as well as at an intellectual level so by watching while you're watching the film you're drawn into it you understand more and then it also makes you think wow, there's a whole load of stuff I don't know. I'm going to go and find out more about this as well. So by grabbing people through the arts, we're actually leading people to both appreciate contemporary arts, but also to look at their own heritage, their family and community's heritage, but also, you know, the world's history and why the history of the world is so pertinent today. A question for both of you then. And thank you for that, really. I mean, response to what 1418 Learners claimed to achieve and did achieve and, you know, the reflection on contemporary artists. We live in interesting times um, and difficult decisions to be made where people shout at each other in Parliament. Um, we have a populist uh, Prime Minister who's got a very um, privileged education but seeks populism in his way to move forward. Um, what do you see as your respective roles going forward as art producer, as artist, in the times we're in? Such an open question, I know. But I guess I, what I'm homing in on is, what is the, what is the role, what is the point? We, we talked about the past, present and future, yes. But let's start with John. Um, I mean, Again, complicated, but let's just take a stride. I mean, one of the things which uh, I learned very early on in this Brexit debate was uh, that I'm living through a, a, a moment when it's clear that people have no problem with goods. You know? They... Goods can come from anywhere, Germany, you know, cars, tomatoes. In fact, the more the merrier. Bring them from all over the world. What we have a problem with is people. We don't want them to come from anywhere. <laughs> Preferably. <laughs> and so there's a very simple humanist project at the heart of all project which should be at the heart of, of our practice at the moment, it seems to me. Which is just persuading people that actually the people matter. Yeah, you know, yes. Cars do too, but people matter. <laughs> <laughs> Especially those German editions. Because <laughs> um, I think the values are slightly skewed. You really feel it. You feel the sense that um, a big part of the discussion was that when we have a border, and the border really is not about the goods, <laughs> sort of about the goods, but, but really it's about people. We really want, you know, um, we don't have a problem with goods. Um, strange, it's just a very bizarre moment to be alive. <laughs> but I like what you said, people matter. Oh, well, I'll do um, I think two reflections, one one on history and one on art. So if you go downstairs one floor to the beautiful mm -hmm. exhibition, um, you'll see in fifty two images of the First World War a letter that I think is written by a Muslim soldier or a, um, to the king. And uh, it's a plea to the king to get involved because the language and discourse in the 
magazines at the time was being too uh, anti-Muslim. And uh, there were cartoons and comments that were upsetting the Muslim community in the UK in 1916. And I stood there reading this and thought, well, that could have been written last night because uh, I don't know if anything's changed much. So that's one reflection of why history matters so much because it contextualizes what's happening today. But I think a uh, more positive reflection is that what artists, uh, and John just has completely um, explained this, what artists can do is they can be um, they can be a humanist project in themselves. They can open up questions. So one of the things that I hope that we were able to achieve with 1418 now was that we removed the idea that there was a narrative to be told about the First World War, and instead we brought in multiple narratives, and we opened up a whole load of questions, many of which people knew about and others of which people had no idea about, um, myself included. And all of those were asked, those questions were asked and the areas were explored with humility and with courage. And it enabled people to connect with each other, I think, with other people. Um, this notion about where we were in the beginning of 2014, you might remember um, a lot of historians were writing books about uh, maybe we should just come out and say we won the war and that's a good thing and the generals were right and this notion that there had to be a new revisionist idea about history that, uh, you know, enough of all of this, you know, 1965 uh, lions led by donkeys, no, we're going to we're gonna tell the story a different way. And all of that disappeared and the reason that it disappeared was that brilliant artists like John said that's actually not of interest to anyone. What's of interest to people is what happened to people. What happened to people People all over the world and let's just have a look at a few things and John John's film doesn't tell us what to think ever no artist would ever want to tell people what to think they just want people to start thinking and that's what they can do for us I don't want you to to get the impression that I, I think only people matter. <laughs> cars <Words>. matter too <laughs> beyond the cars something else matters you know, which is weirdly connected with people. Mm. Environments do too. But but in a way that we don't kind of think about. So mm. the Congo produces you know probably about a quarter of the oxygen we breathe in this country. But and we want the air. We want the oxygen, but we don't want a Congolese man. Mm. Or woman. Mm. So environments can be fluid. And we're quite happy with them. In fact, you know, give people lectures about how the rainforest and the Amazon should be kept. You know. But that's not because we want Brazilians to come here. <laughs> you know? So part of what we have to do is, is to offer that mixed economy in which the, the, the interchange, the interrelatedness of things, how art, and, and its attendant practices needs to force us all the time to enter into the forest of things. And in that forest, things and objects and people mingle. Yes. It's like a kind of Bruegel-like canvas. Um, and we have to keep trying to do that. One of the things which reminds me is that a space like the New York Exchange, based in the environment of high school community. Um, and it's a contemporary art space um, that's working internationally and has a very local feel in terms of its demographic, the use of the space, etc. And increasingly with our learning programs and community engagement. What do you think a space like New York Exchange needs to be going forward? I mean, I think this is the, the, the heart of the, the Brexit project and the heart of all our debates, really. Um, things need to have local dimension. But if they stay purely local and they're not um, cognizant, not receptive, not uh, porous enough to, to take things from elsewhere, 
then they remain sort of nowhere, really. Um, even for the people here, you know. Um, I mean, it's great when you go anywhere on the planet and you take your, your work there. And people are really grateful that you were there because somehow you're being there valorizing them. Mm -hmm. Oh man, this guy from, from England came all the way to Uppsala, um, which has 5,000 people to show you what? Well, that must have be been very important. You know, there's a way in which the, the local is valorized, given, you know, uh, respect, if you will, by, by the outside. No foreigner, no migrant ever goes anywhere to destroy it. I mean, you know, unless they're an empire. <laughs> no, no, not even now. Migratory patterns are relentlessly utopian because they are about saying the way you are going is better. People come here because they think this is better for human beings and where they come from. That is that is a valorization of the local. <laughs> and and we turn it away at our peril. You know? Um, my father always said to me, um, if you have a perception of an enemy and they're in your home, you must treat them as a guest and a friend and a family member eventually. Come on, that's going a bit far. Big round of John and Jenny. Thank you.